Hello all, my name is George O'Neill and I'm one of the postdoctoral fellows here at the Wellcome Centre for Human Neuroimaging. Uh, I'm particularly interested in methods to improve uh, meta-analysis, but today what I'm here to talk to you about is the MEG signal itself, in particular what it is, where it comes from and how we measure it. So just as a brief overview of what we're doing today, we're going to look at the biophysical origin of this MEG EEG signal. Uh, then we're going to have a look at some of the instrumentation to be able to record this data. Uh, then we're going to go on a little brief aside about uh, source sensitivity, what kind of sources you can and may not be able to see depending on which modality you're using. And finally, uh, there'll be a brief introduction to source reconstruction, which we'll talk a lot about later in the course. But I will particularly be focusing on forward modelling, which is quite an important aspect of it. Okay, so uh, for, for those who are not completely au fait with either of the modalities, uh, EEG, uh, electroencephalography, and MEG, magnetoencephalography, are measuring the same underlying neural currents in the brain. Uh, for those who don't really know what the form factor is like, uh, this is an EEG system where you have an array of electrodes which are normally placed on the scalp, uh, as can be seen here. And for a typical MEG setup, you have a series of sensors in a large cryostat here and a person places their head into the recess uh, and the sensors are all placed around the head, but not directly touching in this case. Um, so the particular difference here is that from uh, the neural currents in the brain, which we are recording, EEG is measuring differences in electric potentials across the scalp. And MEG is just measuring magnetic fields which are permeating out from the skull uh, and into free space. So let's start with our uh, macroscopic view of the brain. So just the brain and skull. This is a very simplistic picture and to a physicist like myself, uh, this is normally where I would kind of just leave it. But let's zoom in a bit further and to this kind of mesoscopic scale. And you can see that in, in the head, we've got multiple different parts of the brain. We've got the scalp, we've got the skull, we've got the cerebral spinal fluid, which the brain kind of is suspended in. And we've got the uh, cerebral cortex, which is what we're primarily interested in. And we've got the white matter. So if we zoom into the cortex a bit more, what we can see is that you have this um, stereotypical organisation of the neurons in the cortex. There are these different layers with different kinds of neurons um, existing in different layers. And this is a fairly regular thing across the brain, but you do get slight differences uh, in different brain regions. And this is known as the cortical column, and it's not to be confused with a cortical column column, such as the one which can be found in the reception of our building. So within this cortical column, there's two particular types of cells I would like to point out for you. First are the pyramidal cells, which you normally see in layers two, three, and five, and there are the stellate cells, which are in layer four. So the pyramidal cells, as I've mentioned, are found in layers 2, 3, and 5. Uh, typically, as you can see in this diagram, they're kind of organised uh, perpendicular to the cortical, um, like the cortical ribbon itself, and they're all kind of pointing in the same direction. And what this facilitates is uh, an open field layout. So primarily current flows in the same direction across all nearby cells, and this makes it really detectable with MEG and EEG. Stellate cells, on the other hand, so like the ones found in layer 4, um, their orientations are quite random and the way current flows into them is also kind of, it's, it's, it's homogeneous, it's, it, it changes uh, from cell to cell. And what this results in is a series of closed fields where current can be coming in from all of these directions and over a, a large brain region this can cancel out and we are unlikely to see it. So uh, within the pyramidal cell, there are there's two kinds of neural currents you particularly uh, will be interested in, which are postsynaptic potentials and action currents. So starting with a postsynaptic potential, uh, so an input from another neuron from its synapse will release a series of neurotransmitters, which are then um, allowed to pass through the neural membrane. And when there's a sufficient enough uh, amount of, in this case, positive sodium ions allowed to pass through, you hyperpolarize the area, and this causes a current to flow down from, from the membrane entrance down to the cell body. And this is an excitatory postsynaptic potential. And if you were to measure the potential difference between uh, here where the synapse is and the cell body, you get a massive positive increase in potential, and then a slow decay down. And this takes about 10 seconds. <laughs> 
Uh, but also to preserve charge in the area, uh, which is a fundamental kind of rule of electromagnetism, um, a loop of ionic flow in the opposite direction occurs, so there isn't this build-up of charge. And these are known as uh, extracellular currents. And just as a quick point now, uh, MEG is more sensitive to the intracellular currents in green, and EEG the opposite. You also have inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, which is where basically the opposite happens. So at an inhibitory synapse, which is releasing neurotransmitters, uh, a lot of negative chlorine ions pass through the membrane, and we get a reduction in uh, potential difference from the synapse entrance down to the cell body. So it tries to inhibit the amount of uh, potential in the body. If you have enough excitatory, excitatory uh, potentials, you release an action current from the cell body down the axon to the synapse to pass on to the next um, synapse, uh, to the next neuron even. Um, and the question is, does this contribute to the MEG signal? And the answer is, it's, it's unlikely. It's not a flat out no, but it's not going to be a huge proportion of what we're interested in. And there's a few reasons for it. So first of all, these action potentials, because there's a depolarization and repolarization of the uh, the axon body, um, you generate quadrupoles, and quadrupoles drop off with a distance of one over r cubed, which means that if you're measuring the intensity uh, of a current from a fixed distance, if you were to double that distance, the amount of current you would measure reduces eightfold. Uh, so it drops off very very fast, and this can be problematic. Uh, whereas for a uh, postsynaptic current, they drop off of 1 over r squared, so the uh, the penalty is way smaller. So if you double the distance, it's only a four-fold drop-off. Uh, secondly, action potentials are very, very quick, and they have a very short duration. So here, kind of the, the peak of the lifetime of the action current is actually about 2 milliseconds, compared to 10 milliseconds for a uh, postsynaptic current. Which means that if you need to have multiple of these uh, firing in the vicinity for, for us to see like a net effect outside the brain, they need to be really perfectly lined up and that's less likely when they're this short. Also, there's the added penalty for action currents that because the biphasic can have a positive and negative uh, potential at different points at their time frame, what you can find is that you can have a potential uh, positive uh, action current and a negative nearby action current kind of cancel out at this kind of larger level. Whereas for postsynaptic currents, we don't have this problem because they're either all positive if they're excitatory or all negative if they're inhibitory. So as I've kind of alluded to there previously, um, what we need are multiple neurons firing because one single neuron is not enough. And in this modeling study by Murakami and colleagues, what they what they showed was that you need on the order of tens of thousands of neurons to be able to fire to generate a sufficient neural current in a part of the brain which MEG and EEG are able to detect. So just kind of reiterate what we've said there. Uh, the primary intracellular currents are what are generating the MEG signal largely, uh, which is represented here by this uh, blue loop. And these are quite nice because these can pass through the brain relatively unimpeded. Whereas the volume currents we saw happening in the opposite direction, which are being generated by um, uh, the the uh, EEG uh, generated and detected by EEG, have a slightly tougher time because of the changes in conductivities between these brain regions, uh, and particularly the skull being very um, a poor conductor. You get a large distortion in the topography of these volume current um, potentials. And this can really severely limit the spatial resolution of EEG and makes forward modeling, which we'll talk about later, a bit more difficult. Okay, onto the second section, where we'll kind of briefly touch upon how we measure this signal from outside of the brain. Uh, first, we'll start with EEG, because it's relatively straightforward compared to MEG. Uh, what we have is a series of electrodes which you place on the scalp, uh, sometimes known in what is called a montage. And what we do is we measure from two points at any given time to uh, ensure that we're measuring a potential difference. So, for example, uh, you might remember from, from, from school that if you're measuring a voltage of a battery or across a light bulb, your voltmeter actually has two points, a positive and a negative. And effectively, that's what we're doing here with EEG. So you set your, your reference uh, for your unipolar electrodes uh, somewhere, typically, you normally put it somewhere which is like physiologically not interesting, but will be grounded and still be able to pick up potentials, such as the bony part behind the ear in this example. And then you can have one reference for audio channels. 
Alternatively, you can use some exotic approaches such as a common average referencing, where in this case, you're interested in the signal coming from this red one here, and you take the average potential uh, across all the other channels. Or alternatively, something which is a bit more um, spatially orientated, such as these Laplacian methods, where you would use maybe some neighboring electrodes, the one you're interested in, and use them as your reference points. Alternatively, you might have some bipolar electrodes where you have two where the potentials are subtracted from each other exclusively and don't necessarily need an additional reference. So you might use these if you want to record uh, a cardiac cycle or possibly to check when someone's blinking by putting a pair of electrodes, for example, above and below one of the eyes. Now, for MEG, uh, detecting a signal is far more complicated. Um, so the, 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 the kind of the... The, go the gold standard has been for the last 50 or 60 years is using something called a SQUID, which is an acronym which stands for Superconducting Quantum Interference Device. I won't go into what the whole acronym means, but I will tell you that if you're unfamiliar with superconducting, this is kind of important. A superconductor is a material which has zero resistance, i.e. has infinite conductivity, uh, and these are really useful properties. So in this particular case, we have two superconductors, uh, C1 and C2, and are interrupted by two bits of uh, normal conductors, poorly conducting material, and these are known as Josephson junctions. Uh, when you apply a current between them in the presence of a magnetic field, what you get below is a periodic response in the voltage you can measure across them. And this uh, period is dictated by something called the magnetic flux quantum, uh, which is a very, very tiny number. It's two to the 10 to the minus 15. Um, and what this, this waiver unit here consists of is a relationship between magnetic field and surface area across the magnetic field permeating across the surface area. So if your junction is one centimeter squared, the amount of voltage, uh, the amount of field you can get from this lowest point of voltage to this highest point is uh, 10 picotesla, which is tiny. So these are really, really sensitive ways of measuring magnetic field. Uh, and actually, with good designs, you can get this down to femtotesla, which is 10 to the minus 15. And those uh, are the kind of the order of the magnetic field strength of neural signals from outside of the brain. Now, I said the superconducting part was important because this actually has a very limiting factor on the hardware and the form factor of MEG. So superconductors are only superconducting below a certain temperature. Uh, so if those squids were not superconducting because they're too warm, the effect is lost and we can't measure the magnetic fields. Uh, and in this case, what we do is we keep them below 4 Kelvin, which uh, for those who like Celsius is minus 269, so unbelievably cold. And the way we do this is bathe them in liquid helium. So what this means is we have a series of coils which run up to the squids using mutual inductance, uh, sitting in a bath of helium, uh, which means that you end up with this really bulky hardware and this is the recess which the participant will put their head in. So you've got a really big, heavy, maybe half a ton device which is supported by a massive gantry sitting in someone's head. So this really limits what you can do. So you have to get the person to keep relatively still and this is not always the best thing you want to do if you say want to study someone who's got a movement disorder or children who have very small heads and that are more likely to move around as well. You would ideally want something which is more like an EEG form factor. So as a brief aside, what um, what has been happening in the past few years is that people have been looking for alternatives to squids, which are just as sensitive to detecting these fields. Uh, and there's lots of candidates coming forward, but the most common one you may have heard of are optically pumped magnetometers. Now, these do not require superconducting devices, and these are self-contained sensors, which have been placed very near the scalp, um, which by bringing them near the scalp, that one over R squared problem for postsynaptic potentials becomes reduced, so you get a stronger signal, which means in principle, if the noise floor of these is good, you can get a really improved SNR uh, with your MEG data compared to a squid system. And this is a very early prototype from 2018, and you can see there's a, a, there's a kind of a very restrictive mask holding them in place, and they're quite large sensors with very thick cabling. But the good news is um, the engineering of these has improved, and now we're getting down to things which are the size of a Lego brick and very light and thin cables on the end. So this is the current state of play uh, in our facility uh, here in 2021. And what we can see here is we've got a lower form factor. We've got something which looks more like a cap. And as you can see, our participant is way, way happier here in 2021 than they were back in 2018.
But just as a word to the brave, if you're interested in these OPM systems, um, there isn't really a turnkey solution for them. Uh, if you buy them from a manufacturer at the moment, they send you a bunch of sensors and you've got to figure out what's going on. So proceed with caution. Uh, for those who really are kind of very interested in what's going on here, there is a talk later in the course about some of the technical challenges associated with this. Anyway, assuming that you can detect the signal, uh, there is a very big challenge with noise and environmental artifacts. So this is a graph uh, showing various uh, things which are magnetic, which might be detected by our squids or our OPMs. And this is a logarithmic plot. So each line is something which is 10 times smaller than the thing above it. So we're looking for human responses, which are on the order of maybe a hundreds or tens of femtotesla. And we've got a challenge on our hands here because we need to be able to see this whilst disregarding uh, even other parts of the body, nearby vehicles, which have uh, signals which may be a thousand to 10,000 times stronger. And also we've got to deal with the Earth's magnetic field, which could be like a million times stronger than the thing you want to detect. So currently for, for, for MEG systems, what you typically use is a magnetically shielded room and you house your MEG system, whether it's one of these uh, OPM systems or squid systems in there. And what they consist of is a series of concentric uh, mu metals, which is a type of alloy, uh, copper, aluminium, uh, and other materials uh, in a series of concentric shells. And what this does is that it allows the Earth's magnetic field to get caught up within the metal, and it kind of warps the fields around the walls of the room and back out again the other side, leaving this kind of magnetically quieter part in the middle. And in terms of the amount of shielding this gives us, this gives us um, maybe about a shielding factor of a million, so that the Earth's magnetic field, rather than being um, only a few millitesla, is now down to nanotesla in uh, background strength. However, this only gets you past the way, and also some of these environmental artifacts are time evolving, and shielded rooms are not necessarily the best for this. So we'll take a case in point for us. Uh, we're based here at the Wellcome Centre for Human Neuroimaging, and as you can see on this map, we've got a road right outside our front door, and we've also got the Piccadilly line, a part of the London Underground, directly underneath our building. And it's only maybe at most 50 metres away at any one point. Now, if you were to measure the background field in the room, uh, you can see that we've got quite a lot of variability on the order of nanotesla going on in there. And these lines are representing trains departing from either Russell Square Station or Holborn, which are both very near to us. So as you can see, the shielded room doesn't give you a perfectly static field. And again, we're still probably a few orders of magnitude larger than the signals we want to measure. So the next step is to have some form of active cancellation. And in a squid system, you would use gradiometers. So, so far we've kind of been describing magnetometers where you have a simple coil, which then passes its current up to the mutual inductor and the squid then records that and is digitized later. But what you can do is use two coils which are counterwound to each other, either in an axial, um, formulation, which if you're using a CTF system is probably what you've got, or if you use one of these Alexa or Megan systems, they'll be planar where the uh, wires are counterwound in the same plane as each other. Now what this does is that it forms a, a sort of common mode rejection. So I, so if something with two magnetic, uh, if something which has a very similar magnetic field across both coils uh, will be subtracted and anything which has a, a difference in magnetic field, so you might have a larger signal here and a smaller signal here, is not subtracted to the same extent. So let me try and explain that with this graph. If you've got, say, a train passing nearby, it's generating a very large field, as represented by this red bar here. But the gradients from very far away should be fairly, fairly small. So in principle, these two coils here should be seeing the same thing. And what this results in is a very small gradient being recorded by the gradiometer. You may then have a neural signal which is considerably closer but a lot quieter, so in this case you would have a, a small raw amplitude, but the gradient is larger, so you may see that actually at, at coil 1 you see quite a large field, and then a relatively smaller field at coil 2. So what you get is an improvement in SNR, so for our idealised magnetometer here, the SNR is quite poor, the signal is way smaller than the noise, but you see the inverse is the case of the gradiometer but you do also see that you get some attenuation in your signal. 
And just as a quick aside, um, depending what kind of gradiometers you've got, your uh, topographical plots are quite different to each other. So uh, in this example here, this is from a language study, um, where they used axial gradiometers and simulated planar gradiometers afterwards. Um, what you can see here is that for an axial gradiometer system, if you've got a dipole which is existing here around, say, Heschel's, uh, Heschel's gyrus, um, what you get is two lobes of field nearby in a dipolar format where you have one which is showing uh, positive fields and one which is showing negative fields. For a planar system, you don't see that at all, but what you get is almost the gradient of that. So in this case, what you see here is that you get a large blob, which is roughly where the, this epi is the epicenter of these two lobes. And based on this plot, you would say that the source is directly underneath the hottest spot on the map. Okay, so we'll just go on a brief aside talking about some of the um, drawbacks to sensitivity which you may have using a system like EEG or MEG. So we'll start with the orientation of the source. This is fairly important. So typically we assume that if this is your cerebral cortex or your cortical ribbon, that the, the current flow is perpendicular to the cortex. So what this means is that in different parts of the brain you have different orientations. So you might have things which appear tangential, which are running parallel to the scalp, or you may have things which look radial, like this one in red, where it's perpendicular to the scalp. If you're using an EEG system, you can see both of these, but due to uh, the fundamentals of electromagnetism, the magnetic field uh, doesn't necessarily pass through well if your dipole is oriented uh, radially. And in fact, if you assume that the head is a perfect sphere, Radio dipoles are impossible to detect from outside of the head. Now you might think that's a problem, but what I'll try and do is assuage any fears you may have uh, just suddenly developed. So the simplest argument is the head is a perfect sphere. Not everyone's head looks like Charlie Brown's. Uh, there are always kind of uh, deformations and people have slightly more prolate spheroids for heads. But even if you were to assume that the head was perfectly round and you used a spherical conductor model, if you took their genuine anatomy, uh, so in this study here, they've just used something called the, pro uh, the detection probability of being able to see a source. You can see that for about 70% of all the sources on the cortical surface, you still have um, uh, no problem detecting them at all. You only get to a fundamental limit when you start getting to some of the deeper structures, more on that in a minute. And also if you're at the, uh, the, very, uh, the, the very top of the gyri and the very bottom of the sulci, and they're pointing radially. But also a lot of these sources will have a tangential component, so it's not all completely lost. So I wouldn't worry about it too much, but it is a thing to consider. One thing which is kind of inescapable for both modalities is if you've got two nearby sources with a large spatial extent, there's a strong possibility they can cancel out. And if they cancel out at the sensor level, you will never record them and never be able to recover them at the source level. So this study by Alpha demonstrates this quite nicely. If we've got two sources which are nearby near the midline but are completely in the opposite directions to each other, you can see from the uh, potential patterns or the fill patterns of the individual dipoles, they should be very easy to detect. But as soon as you summate the two, you lose a lot of that intensity and you end up with a more complex field pattern, and this will be a lot harder to be able to recover after the fact. Depth is an issue in particular with MEG, less so with EEG, and that's for a couple of reasons. So first, because our sensors and our coils are quite far away from the scalp originally, um, there's just that extra distance uh, the fields have to permeate compared to uh, EEG, which is on the scalp and a lot closer. But that could be um, uh, uh, that could be all to change if you start using on-scalp magnetometers in the future. But one thing which is inescapable with MEG is that the deeper into the brain you go, the more the radial component of that field dominates. Um, so which could be a problem. What you ideally need is a much stronger signal to come from deeper in the brain for you to be able to detect it, or you just need way better SNR. But what I'll briefly point out here is that it's not impossible to see um, deep structures within the brain. And I've just highlight here two case studies. So this first one from Sophie Mayer in 2017, she was interested in looking at um, the hippocampus and in particular wanted to show that actually modeling the hippocampus and putting the hippocampus into your source space was an important thing and it was anatomically plausible. So she used a metric called free energy or sometimes a form of Bayesian model evidence 
which basically will tell you how plausible your source reconstruction is, and you can compare it against other source reconstructions to find the most likely situation. And in this case here, she added the hippocampus to her source model, and then she started moving around where that hippocampus was. And what she found was that uh, no matter where she moved it, the most plausible location for sources from the hippocampus to occur is in the hippocampus, which means that the MEG is detecting signals from those areas. Um, and if you distort that source space, even by a few millimetres, you are losing information. Uh, second, and this one is probably a bit more stunning and a bit more um, easy to follow, is this study by Pizzo and colleagues where they took a lot of people with drug-resistant epilepsy who had uh, elect invasive electrodes placed uh, into some deeper structures in the brain, and they put them in the MEG to try and record some interictal events. And you can see up here, the black trace is a, a spike, which is detected by the invasive recording. And this red line here is what is detected by MEG when they use some kind of blind source separation. And then if you look at the sensor level topography up here, which is generated by this red trace, and you look at the source information, you can see that these spikes were coming from the amygdala, which was then confirmed by what was seen by the electrodes. But it may not necessarily be deep sources you're interested in, but you want to know if you can actually separate things at very shallow sources, uh, shallow level with very, very small changes in depth. And the answer to that is yes, you can, especially if your SNR is good enough. Um, so this is a nice simulation part of an experimental study where they're interested in the phenomena called beta bursts. Now, I won't go into huge detail about beta bursts, but they're very quick events, about 50 milliseconds or so. And it's hypothesized that a part of the beta burst is driven by pyramidal cells in a superficial layer, like in layer two, and a part of the beta burst is driven by pyramidal cells in layer five, so a bit deeper. So in this study, they simulated uh, two dipoles where a part of the um, Part of the neural signal was generated at the superficial level and then they used a cortical surface which was set much deeper kind of on the white matter boundary and they simulated some source activity coming from down there and then what they did was they they reconstructed on both the superficial layer and the deeper layer and using this metric they could recover from which of the two layers this uh, activity was coming from as recorded by meg correctly so it's kind of cool. You've got this. You've got this spatial precision there if you want it, assuming that you have good enough SNR, you have enough subjects, and people don't move around too much. Okay, we're on to the home straight now, um, and what I want to do is introduce to you uh, source reconstruction, and in particular forward modelling and why it's important. Okay, so so far we've largely been focusing on making sure that your sensor level data is good enough. But you may want to see how that's represented in, in, in cortical space or subcortical space. Now, this is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, a, you might have no idea where an effect is coming from and you want to find out where it's being driven or to confirm a hypothesis you have. Or well, secondly, you may have a priori knowledge of where you want to see um, activity from. And using source reconstruction is a really good way to filter out a lot of the noise and interference and other data from other parts in the brain you're not interested in. And this can give you much better signal to noise ratio for your analysis later. And there's two particular problems. You have the forward problem where if you know where something in the brain is coming from, you want to know how it looks like at the sensor level and vice versa, which is known as the inverse problem. And I'll go into these in a bit more detail now. OK, there's a little bit of maths in this section. Uh, don't necessarily have to follow the maths, but I'm hoping I can give you some intuition to what the maths is telling you and what's important for you to consider going forward. So, if you observed MEG sensor level data, which you've called Y here, um, for a given time point, you can say, we think it's generated from a series of sources in the brain. It could be an infinite number, or it could be a limited number. And here I've just called it K. Typically, when you do source reconstruction, you maybe model a few thousand of these at once. And all it is, is simply a sum of three different things. Okay, so, so in this case here, you're interested in the source activity or the source strength at this point in time from a single source. But also you need to know how that source is represented at the sensor level. And these are sometimes known as lead fields or gain matrices. And here this epsilon is just everything else we can't explain. So that could be all the dipoles we've not modeled or it could be external interference or just anything we haven't considered properly. 
Now, what I want to do for just to simplify this equation for, for argument's sake is we're just going to encapsulate all the time. So we have all our data from a, from a single recording across all time. We have all our light lead fields and we have all of our source activity across time. Now, from your basic algebra, you may see, OK, we, we know this and we've got two variables we don't know, which is going to be quite hard to solve. But the good news is uh, we can solve this forward problem as described here. Um, so if we know where a source is, or we think we know where a source is, or we want to model where a source is, we can, can we estimate what that should look like at the sensor level? So for example, if we've got a dipole, which is located here, could we be able to make an assumption of where the magnetic fields and the electric potentials should be if we've got a series of sensors? And yes, we can, uh, because for a given dipole, only one unique solution would exist for this problem, which makes it relatively straightforward to solve. Okay, so now we're just going to briefly touch upon the mathematical formulation of how you would be able to calculate this. Again, don't necessarily worry about the equations, but hopefully just what I think they're telling you. So this is our pyramidal cell, and we've got a primary current, our intracellular current, running down from, say, um, an apical dendrite down to the cell body. And this is producing a magnetic field here in blue. And we've also got our volume currents here in pink. So to measure the total current from a point in space, we need to consider the primary currents and these volume currents together. So here it's just a simple sum of the two. And then I've just rewritten the, uh, the volume current term to show you where the electric potential, the part we're interested in for the EEG, comes from. We also need to consider the magnetic field. And this is generated by a law called the biot savart law, which if you've got a current in a certain part in space, the total magnetic field detected elsewhere follows this relatively simple equation uh, for electromagnetism anyway. Okay, so let's consider uh, a fairly easy model. Let's assume that your brain is either a massive vacuum or possibly an infinitely large slab of conductive material, such as agar or, or brain, for example. The good news is that these volume currents here in pink no longer contribute to the equation at all. And just to show you what the end results look like, what we end up with is the primary magnetic field, which I've called B infinity, uh, which is just the primary currents. And also for the electric potential, there's a very similar looking equation. We still get this horrible integral where we need to consider everything within a brain volume. But what I'll try and do is simplify this even further just to show you that this is quite a nice thing. So rather than talking about J, we're going to talk about a current dipole called Q. And the amount of current which is measurable from Q is zero everywhere in the brain, apart from at the point at where this dipole is modeled to exist. And then we have this term, which is R minus RQ, which is basically the distance between the two sen the sensor and the original dipole. And what we can do here is we can simplify these equations even further. So if you want to know what the magnetic field for at a given sensor looks like, all you need to know are effectively three things. Where the sensor is, where the source is, and also in which direction the source is pointing, and how strong the current from that source is. For the potential, we've just got a slightly extra term. Uh, we just need to know the conductivity of the material which the electric potentials are transmitting through. Unfortunately for us, that's actually a really, really simple model, and we need to go into something which is way more complicated, uh, potentially. So let's take this arbitrary shaped brain. So imagine this is the brain and this is the skull, for example. Uh, we've got two uh, bound surfaces with different conductivities, sigma 1 and sigma 2. Uh, the surfaces are represented by these uh, bold lines, and n are the normal vectors, so just pointing out from the surface perpendicularly. The equations get very scary very quickly, especially if you're not used to seeing this kind of mathematics. Um, and, and I can imagine right now you are probably thinking, what on earth is going on? Why am I showing you these? But really what I'll try and do is highlight three key points we need to consider about our lead fields and what we're measuring. First of all, the observable magnetic fields are partly dependent on these volume currents. Uh, so you might need to consider these. Um, secondly, uh, 
To calculate the potentials outside of the head, we need to go back to those individual boundaries and we need to calculate the potential at those points where conductivity changes, which becomes more complicated. And finally, we need to be very careful with considering anatomy. So we need to consider the shape, which is kind of encapsulated by N here. And we need to know the tissue types and the tissue conductivity, which is represented by these sigmas. So there's a lot going on. This is very numerically uh, quite heavy and it could be incredibly tedious. However, the good news is that a lot of people spent a lot of effort trying to simplify these problems and have come up with a lot of solutions which for, say, an SPM user, a lot of these are just point and click and you don't really need to do this yourself. Uh, we'll start off with these spherical methods here. The simplest thing you can do is assume that you have a sphere and I won't go into the details why, but what this means is actually very immediate. You don't even need to consider what conductivity is going on in the brain that just disappears entirely. Uh, so originally people started off with a single sphere and then these spheres got more complicated. So some decided that actually rather than using one sphere to represent the brain, you could use a series of smaller but partly overlapping spheres, which looks more like a brain shape. And then someone else suggested that what you should do is have a look at the anatomy and then warp your sphere using spherical harmonics to have something which looks a bit more like the brain cavity. For EEG, you need to go a bit more complicated than that, and you can for MEG as well, um, where you need to consider the actual kind of accurate geometry of the brain, so maybe where the, where you get to the, the CSF to bone boundary and then back to the scalp again, and you need to consider these different changing tissue types, because as we mentioned earlier, these volume currents are distorted by the changes in conductivity, so you need to consider these to get a good idea of what's going on. And you can either simplify this by having a few boundaries where you can go from maybe bone back to scalp, or you can go very complex using something called a finite element model, where effectively each small volume of space is its own boundary. Um, and from here you can see in this example they've got uh, conductivity measures for white matter for the cortex here in deep blue, and then we've got the spinal fluid, then we've got the bone, and then we've got the scalp. And you can there's an arms race to how many components you actually need to this, and they're getting increasingly complex, especially as computational power becomes uh, cheaper and more readily available. So for MEG, you could use these complex models, and there is some credence to doing that, especially if, say, you are possibly scanning someone who's had epilepsy and they've had a large part of the brain sections. These simpler models may fall apart. But for, for everybody else, I uh, just wanted to show you that if if you start off with one of these boundary element models, which could be considered state-of-the-art at one point a time, uh, by taking certain simplifications, you do lose something in these simplifications. And actually also for segmentation. So for example, this top row here, these were hand segmented and then reviewed by several people. So this is the boundary between the skin and the bone, bone and spongy bone, etc. And then you go down to slightly more automatic methods as you go further. Uh, the heat maps here represent how much difference there are between the lead fields generated by this boundary element model and other models. So you can see here that in this single sphere solution, the very front and the back of the brain are very poorly represented compared to a boundary element model. Uh, but what is kind of surprising, I guess, is that this single sphere model, where they use the spherical harmonics to distort a sphere, is actually a really, really good proxy, uh, proxy for a boundary element model itself. And computationally, it's way, way cheaper than a boundary element model. So I guess given that is all of these things to consider, um, all these different kinds of models, what would I recommend to most people? Now, this is my personal opinion, though some will agree with me, many might disagree. For most users, if you're looking at, say, healthy controls, but there's no real known differences in the anatomy, such as a hole in the head or, or, or sections have been taken out of the brain, for EEG, use one of these three shell boundary element models or something more advanced, but the boundary element model is a, is a good place to start. For MEG, you can go even simpler. You can use one of these uh, corrected spheres, um, which as we've just shown in the previous slides, is a very, very close resemblance to a boundary element model, which is really cool considering you don't even need to input conductivity measures into it. Um, and luckily for most people, these are the default options in SPM as well. Okay, so we've gone to all of that effort to solve the lead fields. So we've now got this which we know, this which we've calculated. So we've only got one variable left, 
So given the set of observations at the sensor level and our knowledge of the forward problem, can we estimate where in the brain they originate from? And the answer is yes. So you're like, cool. Can we just solve it for just rearranging the equations to make J the subject, which is what you might do in algebra? And the answer is no. This is an ill-posed problem for a couple of reasons, but the two takeaway points here are this. There are way many more sources than sensors. So if you've got several thousand dipoles and maybe only 64 EEG electrodes or maybe uh, 300 MEG sensors, that is not ideal for trying to simply invert a matrix. Um, also, kind of touching on what we had earlier about uh, opposite and extended sources, they cancel out as well. So technically, there are an infinite number of possible solutions which may be available. Now, I'm not going to go into the details for how we solve for these sources, but this is something which will be uh, discussed at great length later in the course. So just to summarise what's been going on here, uh, MEG and EEG are direct measures of the neural activity from within the brain, uh, measured from the outside of the brain with high temporal resolution. Uh, the signal which we are measuring is predominantly based on a bulk behaviour of tens of thousands of pyramidal cells, largely from their excitatory uh, postsynaptic potentials. Uh, MEG, uh, its biggest challenge it has is ensuring that the SNR is high enough for you to actually be able to use this data, given that there are, uh, uh, there's a lot of interference, which is several orders of magnitude larger than the signal we are trying to measure. Uh, EEG, this is less of a problem, and it's also uh, way more sensitive to deep and radial sources than MEG. But these conductivity changes between different brain compartments uh, really affect the signal. So if you're looking for spatial precision or spatial localization, this makes things a bit more difficult. But it's not impossible because there are models of electromagnetism which can describe how a current from a certain part of the brain should manifest as a potential or a magnetic field outside of the head. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up there. I've been jabbering on for about 40 minutes or so. So thank you very much for listening. I hope some of this has been useful for you. And assuming there are no technical difficulties, uh, I should be handing over to you live for questions and answers. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you.